Uh, it's time for our second hour to begin. And in the chat room, there were a couple of comments and one question made in regards to Gnosticism that uh, Howard mentioned that one can see how these doctrines still pervade in the world today, and that is extremely true. Uh, if you start looking at these doctrines, you really start seeing a an aspect of uh, many of the beliefs and the origin how these beliefs originated that we see in the religious world. Uh, the doctrine of total depravity comes directly from this dualism uh, that is seen in Gnosticism that the body is itself evil. Uh, the Jehovah's Witnesses that I mentioned as we were going through there, uh, the Methodist idea of the second working of grace and perfectionism, uh, so you have all of these doctrines that really find their origin back in Gnosticism. Uh, and so if people realize that, maybe it would help them come out of some of these false doctrines that we see. Uh, then Jerry asked, was there a belief of the soul and spirit being separate by the Gnostics? And I would, uh, I don't know specifically, I would think that uh, they would say that they would would both be the spiritual aspect of soul and spirit would be synonymous, and thus that the soul or the spirit would be good and righteous and holy, uh, as opposed to the matter. So you have spirit or soul. I think they would say either one uh, being good and matter, I mean, all matter being evil. So I, I think that's where they would go with that, but I don't know for certain, um, uh, but I think that's probably how they would uh, explain that. Okay, as we continue in our introduction of John, or First John, and really, uh, to a certain extent, uh, that dealing with Gnosticism uh, is necessary for understanding all of John's writings, uh, and with the exception maybe of Revelation, uh, but realizing that he was dealing with that false doctrine in particular. I wish that I had time to deal a little bit more in detail with the aspect of bringing joy in 1 John 1 and verse 4, how that uh, the joy there, yet uh, he turns around and tells us uh, that uh, while he's writing to bring joy, he then tells us that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. Uh, how, is that, how does that bring joy to the Christian? Uh, well, we'll look at that as we go through. Uh, the first chapter a little bit. First John, there's no writing possibly that's more profound than First John. It expresses depths of thoughts that are almost unfathomable. Yet, John is written as far as uh, simplicity of sentence structure and construction, the simplicity of the Greek language. It's noted for its simplicity. As one studies the Greek language, there is uh, very clearly the aspect of you study Greek and then you immediately start translating 1 John because of the simplicity of writing as to the Greek language. Uh, and yet there's a depth of thought there that uh, is just amazing that is presented to us. Uh, you don't have to be and use terminology and language that is so difficult to understand to, per, to express deep thoughts. Um, and John did not do that. He used very simple structures as far as construction and word language uh, to express those deep thoughts of God. Emphasis, a second idea, is emphasis is given to ideas by, by means of repetition and parallelism. Uh, there is a certain reiteration or a reiteration of certain words. For example, love. The word love is found four, 51 times, or one of its forms, 51 times in 1 John. 
no uh, in its various forms is found over 40 times in John. God, or Father, is found 74 times. Jesus Christ is found 27 times. Uh, you also have light is found several times. Uh, life, light, and life, both of them. Then there's the parallelism of, of John. And when we're dealing with uh, the poetry of the Bible, that's what we're dealing with is parallelism. And there are, uh, there are several different types of parallelism. There's two that uh, are specifically apropos for studying John and his writings. The first uh, would be uh, synthetic parallelism. Uh, that is, one line says something, the second line says the same thing. Understand that when we're dealing with the parallelism of the Bible, it's not always simply a line, one line, and then another line like we deal with many times in uh, the poetry of the Bible as far as Old Testament poetry books, uh, Psalm or Proverbs and those books. We talk about lines. Sometimes it is entire sections, and you have a repetition of sections. That's John's writings to a great extent. It is one section says something, then the next section says something else. Uh, for example, uh, look at uh, John chapter 2 and verse 11. Uh, you see, um, starting there, uh, but he that hateth his brother is in darkness, and walketh in darkness, and knoweth not whither he goeth, because that darkness hath blinded his eyes. There is a synthetic parallelism there, or a synonymous parallelism, where uh, he is saying the same thing, but he, synonymous is saying the same thing. Synthetic is adding thoughts to it. Uh, look at chapter 4. And uh, verse 5, uh, they that are of the world, or they are of the world, therefore speak they of the world, and the world heareth them. There is a continuation of thoughts, that synthetic parallelism. And you have three statements there. They're of the world is the first statement. He adds to that, they speak of the world. That's the second statement, which he has added to. They are of the world, now and they speak of the world. The third thing that he adds to now, the world hears them. So he's adding thoughts to it. That's synthetic parallelism. You have, on the other hand, antithetic parallelism, where the first line or the first section says something, and then the second says it in the opposite way. Um, for example, 1 John 1, or chapter 2, verse 4 and verse 5. He that saith, I know him, and keepeth not his commandments, is a liar, and the truth is not in him. But whoso keepeth his word, in him verily is love of God perfected. Hereby know we that we are in him. Um, so here's the one who knows him but does not keep his commandments, he's a liar, the truth is not in him. That's stated one way. He turns it around now, whoso keeps his word, in him the love of God is perfected. And we are in him. Uh, we know that we are in him. Why? Because we're keeping his word. So he, he deals with it from a negative standpoint, then turns around, deals with it from a positive standpoint. Uh, skip down a few verses, verses 9 and verse 10. He that saith he, he is in the light and hateth his brother is in darkness even till now. He that loveth his brother abideth in the light, and there is none occasion of stumbling in him. So he says the same thing. He says it from the opposite standpoint. That's parallelism. Uh, you could also look at verse 17 and many other uh, phrases. So you have a repetition either from an opposite standpoint from the same standpoint, synonymous parallelism, or from an additional aspect, synthetic parallelism. And as we look at uh, the outline, as we'll do in just a moment, 
of John. You're going to see basically John is uh, setting forth parallelism even in sections there because he's going to say something in one section, then he's going to say it in a different way in another section, and then he's going to say it again and again. So that's what you have with John. There is a repetition of thoughts. Uh, that are being stated. And he does that with the reiteration of certain words. He does it with the thoughts as well. Then there is also a great stress placed on the Greek tenses. And I want to deal with a few of them uh, right now because uh, the Greek tense is important within John. It helps us to understand the book of John. Uh, the first, and we're going to deal with the tense, and understand when we're dealing with English, the tenses in English, we're dealing basically with three things. It is whether it is past tense, it's whether it's present tense, or future tense. We deal with time element in relationship to the tenses of the English language. Past time, present time, future time. Greek tense deals with not time, but the kind of action that is under consideration. And so you have first the present tense. Um, present tense. The present tense deals with a continuous action. The action is continuing to take place. Um, many times in, our, in the King James in particular, uh, you will find these words ending with E-T-H. Um, the E-T-H is basically trying to present to us that continuous action, that this is a present tense verb in the Greek, and that this action thus that he's dealing with is continuing to take place. Uh, that's the present tense. Um, and, well, uh, you will recall, for example, in uh, chapter 3, uh, he that, uh, well, he that saith he, uh, he is in the light and hateth his brother, is in darkness even till now, hateth is that present tense. He continues to hate his brother. Um, that's one aspect in which you start seeing this, but I, I was really thinking of another uh, passage, and we'll get to it later on. But uh, the idea of, uh, well, maybe that's why I was in chapter 2 instead of chapter 3. Um, yeah, chapter 3 and verse 9. Whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin. A lot of people have misunderstood that. How in the world can that one who is born of God not commit sin? And they have difficulty understanding it. Very simple when you understand that he's dealing with the continuous action. Whosoever is born of God does not continue to commit sin. In other words, he's not living in sin. Sin is not his way of life, uh, as opposed to, will he commit isolated acts of sin? Yes, but he's not continuing in sin. Um, you would see that in uh, chapter 1 and verse 7. But it, uh, if we walk in the light as he is in the light, well, walk, there is continuous action, present tense. Uh, then... We have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his Son, cleanseth us from all sin. Cleanseth again, present tense, continues to cleanse us of our sins. So that's present tense. The next tense that we want to at least mention is the aorist tense. The aorist tense deals with, and it's generally referred to as point action. Um, and it is, uh, an, deals more with an isolated act. Sometimes it's referred to as completed action. From the standpoint, it, it is an action that is completed. Uh, it's not continuing. 
but it's completed. It is a point action. Uh, sometimes uh, the Greek tenses are dealt with as far as, for example, a line would be linear action. You have a line that's taking place there. That's continuous action would be present tense, as opposed to a point would be the aorist tense, a point action that does not continue, so a point action. For example, and uh, if we uh, say that we have no sin, well, he's dealing with point action there, aorist tense. If we say that we never have committed an, even an isolated act of sin, uh, then we deceive ourselves. The truth is not in us. Um, but there's that point action, aorist tense, that's there. Um, and uh, if you look at chapter 2 and verse 1, we might, you know, we'll get to these a little bit and won't deal with them in, uh, by a full, complete study of them. But he says, chapter 2 and verse 1, My little children, these things write I unto you, that ye sin not. He uses the aorist tense. Point action, that you never commit even an isolated act of sin. Uh, if you want to talk about the all-sufficiency of the Bible, that's a good passage to, that deals with it. I'm writing, John says, so that you will never commit even one isolated act, point action, sin. Yet, if any man sin, that again, point action, we have an advocate with the Father Jesus Christ the righteous. He's already stated, we, if anyone says he never commits even an isolated act of sin, he is a liar, the truth is not in him. But he's writing so that we will not commit even an isolated act of sin. Well, that's aorist tense. Another tense is the perfect tense. The perfect tense. This is, and if, if you're dealing with it uh, in a line or point, you have a point out here with a line going from it. So it is a completed action with continuous results. Uh, so it's continuous results here. Uh, and you could say, for example, Christ died for our sins. That is, he, there's that completed act, his death, but the results of that death are even valid today and are useful today. Uh, his blood still cleanses us from our sin. Uh, past action or completed action, a point action with a continuing result. Then the imperfect is the other one that we want to deal with, and there's actually other tenses in the Greek. I'm not trying to be complete, but I'm trying to deal with the ones that we would see primarily in John. The the imperfect is a linear action, a line, but dealing with in the past, basically. So a linear action in the past. It's a type of action that's in the past, yes, but it's a, uh, not a point action. It's a continuous action that has taken place uh, in the past. So that would be the imperfect tense. Uh, those would be the Greek tenses. And I have uh, one commentary, actually, that uh, it's not uh, so much a commentary as it is uh, basically, it goes through the entire book and gives you the tense of every verb that's found in the book because the importance of the Greek tense uh, that's found. And I would um, I would encourage you to find some way, uh, whether it's uh, online. Uh, I know that there's some uh, Bibles that you can get online that will show you the Greek tense. And pay attention to the Greek tense as you study uh, John. And as I say, we're not really going to have an opportunity to do that as we study this uh, because of lack of time. But uh, you will find it very helpful in your understanding and to help you understand uh, the book of 1 John. Because there is a great deal of tense, uh, uh, play on tense or play on words as far as the Greek tense is concerned. Uh, as we look in the outline of the book, 
and basically I'll give you the outline as we go through it so that we won't uh, spend our time just detailing the outline of the book, but it has five chapters. There's 105 verses, and it takes about 15 minutes to read, and that is, is at a very nominal reading rate. Now then, let's uh, go into a study of First John with all of this as background and as introduction. In the first four verses, we have the introductory statements, uh, the introduction, and that is Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and is the basis for writing. He states uh, that which we have, that which we have, which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which are, we have looked upon, and our hands have handled of the word of life. For the life was manifested, and we have seen it, and bear witness, and show unto you that eternal life which was with the Father, and was manifested unto us. That which we have seen and heard declare we unto you, that ye also may have fellowship with us. And truly our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. These things write we unto you, that, you, uh, that your joy may be full. Uh, let me, before we really get into this, uh, mention one thing in relationship to this. And I want you to notice the phrases that are found here in relationship to you and the emphasis, uh, starting in verse 2, and show unto you, verse 3, declare we unto you that ye may have uh, fellowship with us. Uh, then verse 4, uh, these things write we unto you, and then verse 5, uh, and declare unto you. There is an emphasis that he gives upon you there. Um, and as he begins, uh, notice uh, it's unusual. Uh, five times he uses the neuter instead of the masculine, which we would uh, really expect here in relationship with Christ. Instead of he who is from the beginning, who we have heard, who we have seen with our eyes, who we have looked upon, and our hands have handled of the word of life, instead of using that masculine phrase or masculine gender, he uses the neuter gender, that which, and which we have heard, which we have seen, which we have looked upon, and our hands have handled. The neuter, five times in these first few verses, um, he uses the neuter instead of the masculine. I personally believe that he is he does that because of the Gnostic view that he's writing the opponents. That he is setting forth here he is something that is actual substance. And thus that which he's dealing with the substance, the physical body of Jesus and that physical nature of Jesus. And he's trying to stress that aspect of it. And in, so instead of using the masculine as would be expected in dealing with man, he uses the neuter so that he can express that aspect of here he is that physical nature that we have. And thus the Christ is that one who is and has a physical body. Notice, and I wish we had time, and we could probably spend an entire class period on the phrase, uh, from the beginning. It's the Greek word arche, A-R-C-H-E, if you're spelling it out. Arche. And its equivalent is found in Genesis 1 and verse 1 in the Hebrew, that in the beginning... Um, and, well, I've got John 1, verse 1. Uh, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. In the beginning. Same phrase that we would find here in relationship to that. Question, beginning of what? Beginning of everything that we know of. But he uses, and if you go to John 1 and verse 1, in the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God. But the, we use that a lot of times in relationship to Jehovah's Witnesses, and we stress the Word was God. 
I think we uh, miss a great opportunity by the word was. The word in the beginning was the word. In the beginning, in our case, was, you have an imperfect tense. Something that was past action, completed. In other words, before time began, before the beginning, you had the word. That's what he's expressing here, and thus he is dealing with the fact that this one who we felt and we uh, heard uh, that physical substance existed before the beginning of the world, before time began, even. He was in existence. And so G, uh, John is setting forth the very eternal nature of this being which they felt and heard and saw and looked upon and all of that. The apostles did all this to what? That one who was in existence before the creation of the world, before time began. And so that eternal nature, which would be not matter, but spirit, is that one who also has that physical makeup of a body. And so he is showing that Jesus is the Christ. There is no distinction between them as the Gnostics tried to make it appear, that he is both eternal and he has a physical body. There's not that dichotomy that the Gnostic tried to present. And he says, we, the apostles, we saw him, we heard him, we felt him, we looked upon him, our hands handled him. He had a physical body. Um, and we're bearing witness of. He was with the Father. He was manifested unto us. So there's his eternal nature. He was with the Father. He was with God. But here he is, man is him also. In other words, he was manifested unto us so that we could see him and feel him and he has that physical body as well as that eternal nature. Jesus the man is Christ the Spirit. There is no distinction that the Gnostic tried to make between the two. They are one and the same. Uh, there's no distinction. And we declare him unto you. Why? So that we can have fellowship with God and with man. I guess we could spend the rest of the time dealing with the aspect of fellowship, and the basis of fellowship is found right here. Uh, anytime we start dealing with fellowship, you really almost have to start with 1 John 1, uh, because it is a passage dealing with fellowship. Here's fellowship first is with God. Is with God. How do we have fellowship with God? Well, John is going to set forth how we have fellowship with God, and that is we're going to have to walk in the light. It takes obedience, and we'll see that in, as we go through John. Um, then, when we have fellowship with God, we can then have fellowship with one another, with man. And John is dealing specifically with the apostles, those who are declaring these things unto you. Uh, your fellowship is with us and with the Father and his Son, Jesus Christ. Notice the emphasis, uh, many times, Jesus Christ. He wants to combine the two uh, and not show that dichotomy or that uh, dualism of the Gnostic, but that Jesus is the Christ. Now, and he says, I'm writing these things so that literally our joy, not your joy, as is in the King James, but literally, our joy may be full. Both of our joy. Why? Because we can have fellowship with God. So, verses 1 through 4, we have the introduction. Um, and 
in that, and I didn't uh, copy this into the chat room, so I'll do that now, uh, verses 1 through 4 of chapter 1. The introduction, Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and then he gives a basis for writing. The first major section, then, is that God is light. We must walk in light. Chapter 1, verse 5, through chapter 2, and verse 28. So God is light. We must walk in the light. The first section under that would be what walking in the light involves. And that's chapter 1, verse 5, through chapter 2, and verse 6. And the first section under that, walking in the light, involves fellowship with God and with the brethren. Uh, chapter 1, verses 5 through 7. And he sets forth, beginning on that, well, let's read those verses. This, then, is a message which we have heard of him and declared to you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. If we say we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ his Son cleanseth us from all sin. Fellowship with God and with the brethren. And he sets forth, and again, remember, he's writing so that our joy might be complete. And he begins by saying God is without sin. How in the world does that bring joy to the Christian? To think, here I am, and I am, I realize I commit sin. I know that I commit sin. And here's God without sin. How in the world can that bring joy to me? If anything, that would bring uh, unhappiness. Uh, it would bring the opposite aspect of joy. And yet John is saying, I'm writing so your joy will be complete. And now then, God is without sin. In him is no darkness at all. And we start seeing the very holy nature of God. Um, I think, uh, and I might be wrong about this, but it's my opinion, that really the basic nature of God is that of holiness. And that's what's presented in the scriptures. When uh, Isaiah sees the God, uh, he sees the seraphim crying out, Holy, 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 Isaiah the sixth chapter. In Revelation the fourth chapter, in this scene of God, there's again those crying out, Holy, holy, holy. The holy nature of God is the very basic nature of God. Uh, and things come from that holy nature of God. Um, but what we're saying when we talk about the holy nature of God is the fact that God is light and there is no darkness at all in him. In other words, God cannot be associated with sin. Uh, Habakkuk 1 and verse 13 says that thou art of pure eyes and behold iniquity and canst not look upon sin. God is separate from sin. He is without sin. And here in relationship to, and again we see the, the antithetic parallelism. God is light, in him is no darkness at all. So you see light contrasted with darkness. Um, John uses there in the latter phrase, there is no darkness at all, or in him is no darkness at all. He uses a double negative. It's improper in, in English, but it's very proper in Greek because it is something that gives emphasis to. He is giving emphasis to the fact that there is absolutely no spot of darkness in God. No, not any is the way we might say. There is no darkness in God, no, not any uh, is, might be the way in which we would express it. Uh, that double negative to give emphasis to not any darkness in him. Uh, he is total light, total purity. Now then, if we walk in sin, then we do not have fellowship with God. Um, if we claim to have fellowship with God and we live in sin, then he says we're liars. We do not the truth. Uh, 
we're not living and we do not have fellowship with God or with the brethren if we live in sin. And again, notice the Gnostic aspect of this because these Epicureans and uh, Libertines, Antinomians, said, go ahead and live like you want to. Allow the body to continue to do whatever it wants to. And through knowledge, we're going to have fellowship with God anyway, even though the body's living in sin. Now, John is combating that idea. No, you're not going to have fellowship with God if you're walking in darkness. And he uses here a uh, continuous action, the present tense. If we continue to have fellowship with him, or if we say we continue to have fellowship with him, and we continue to walk in the darkness, present tense, we continue to lie, present tense, and we do not the truth, present tense, continue not to do the truth. But if we walk in the light, there's that aspect now uh, setting forth again, the antithetic parallelism. If we say that we have fellowship with God and walk in darkness, we don't, we're don't. we liars. We're not doing the truth. We don't have fellowship with him. But if we walk in the light, continuous action, continue to walk in the light, then we have fellowship, or as he is in the light, and that is, again, continuous action, present tense, is there in the light, we have, continue to have, fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his Son, cleanseth us, continuous action, of all sin. Let me uh, deal with one aspect of the false doctrine that we hear today, um, sometimes referred to as um, an umbrella of grace, and other terms such as that, uh, that when we are baptized, that Christ blood takes away all of our sins and they say it not from the standpoint simply of all of our past sins but all of our sins totally period uh, he takes away all of our sins both past and future sins that we might commit have already been taken away no that's not the case um, our past sins have when we repent of them, of course. Uh, but those sins, if we commit isolated acts of sin, as long as we are walking in the light, then Christ's blood will take away those sins. That's what he's setting forth here. As long as our lifestyle is that of walking in the light. And let me make it a distinction here also between something that we hear a lot of times, well, I'm nothing, we're nothing but sinners. Uh, well, that's not the case. Christian is not a sinner. He will commit isolated acts of sin, verses 8 through 10, and that gets that next section of consciousness of sin. But a Christian, while there is a consciousness of sin, he does not continue in sin. He's not living a lifestyle of sin. He's dealing with point action sin. Yes, he will commit point action sin. So let's look, verses 8 through 10. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. He uses both the aorist and the present tenses here. If we say that we have no sin, point action, aorist tense. If we say that we never commit even an isolated act of sin, well, he sets forth four things. Number one, we deceive ourselves. Number two, the truth is not in us. Number three, we make God a liar. And number four, God's word is not in us. Now then, we've deceived ourselves because we do all commit isolated acts of sin. The Christian is not walking in sin, his lifestyle is not sin, but he still will commit those isolated acts of sin. There is a distinction between someone who is a sinner, that is, someone who's living a lifestyle of sin, and someone who is living a lifestyle of righteousness and yet will, even in that lifestyle righteousness, occasionally fall and stumble and commit an isolated act of sin. Now, the two aspects are what John is dealing with. 
if we have fellowship with God and to have fellowship with God, we have to have a lifestyle where we are, do not commit sin, where we are not living in sin, but we are living in righteousness. But in living in righteousness, there will be times in which we will occasionally fall and stumble and commit an isolated act of sin. Now then, if we should, though, claim that we never commit an isolated act of sin. Now then, again, go back to the Gnostic view. Gnostic view, one of them was that of perfectionism. We don't commit sin. We are separate from sin. Uh, John is saying, if you claim that, Yet you never commit an isolated act of sin. You're deceived because you do. The truth is not in us. You're making a claim that's false. We make God a liar. Why? Because God has said man has sin. And man does commit sin. God's word is not in us. The conclusion of the scriptures, Galatians 2 and verse 22, is that man is, has sin. So there's the four results if we claim we never have committed even an, we never commit even an isolated act of sin. Now then, he sets forth the condition for forgiveness as well. When we sin, that is, make those isolated acts of sin, what happens? We confess our sins. Confess is present tense. We continue to confess our sins. Now, what's confess? Well, we have a word. It literally means to have a word together with. God has said, man has sinned. The conclusion of the scriptures is that man has sinned. Uh, Galatians 3.22. Here, God says man has sinned. Romans 3.23, all of sin comes short of the glory of God. So there's the conclusion of God. Man has sinned. We have a word together with. That's confession. God says, man has sinned, I say, I have sinned. So we're having a word together with God. Now, when we continue to have that word together with God, then, in relationship to sin, then God will forgive us. Now, confession of sin, understand, is having a word together with God, but... Who do we confess to? We make a confession to whoever we have sinned against uh, and those individuals who thus know the sin. If um, I sin against uh, Joe Blow out here and I don't go to someone else way over someplace else and confess to that individual that I sinned against Joe Blow. I go to Joe Blow and I tell him I make a confession of sin in relationship to him because I've sinned against him. And then I go to God because that all sin is ultimately against God. Sometimes no one else knows the sin. It might be a sin of attitude, a sin that's been done in secret. In that situation, who do I confess to? I don't confess to man, but I confess to God. I've sinned. I've fallen short of what you wanted within my life, and I'm making it right with God. Sometimes that sin is known to everyone. And in that situation, we then confess to everyone that it would be, in that sense, a public confession of wrong, that I have sinned. I've done that which is wrong, that is contrary to God's word, and God has convicted me of sin by the word which he set forth. And I'm having thus a word together with God in a public nature because everyone knows that I have committed this sin. And thus, when I do that, when I have that confession of sin, then God will forgive me. He will cleanse me from all unrighteousness. Notice that we mentioned, I said that the word confess our sin, confess there is present tense. We continue to confess our sins. Well, so is... Um, and he will cleanse us, though as heirs, those times which we sin. I commit an isolated act of sin. I living a lifestyle of confessing my sins because I'm walking in the light. That is a part of walking in the light is a continual confessing of our sins. Then those times when I commit those isolated acts of sin, 
God will forgive me. God will cleanse me of that unrighteousness. Interesting contrast between the present tense and the heiress tense. But uh, the idea also of confess there would also uh, imply what uh, all confession is involved, and that certainly would be a repentance of our sin, as we would see uh, back in Acts the 8th chapter, uh, where he was supposed to uh, com repent of his sins and pray God. That would also be, because all sin is ultimately against God, thus confess to him. That's pray to God if, as uh, Paul told Simon, or Peter told Simon, the thought of your heart might be forgiven you. So that confession of sin would be the inclusion, including of making things right with that individual that we've sinned against. And that know, those who know the sin, confessing that or admitting it to them that we have committed sin, it would also include going to God as well as a repentance of that sin. And a repentance means to setting things in a proper way, proper right uh, situation, setting them as they were before or as they are supposed to be. So all of that would be involved in that consciousness of sin. Chapter 2, then, verses 1 through 6, that next section, deals with obedience. Now we're dealing with, again, remember the main heading here is God is light, we must walk in the light. And then what walking in the light involves? Well, first, fellowship with God and with his brother. Second, a consciousness of sin. Now then, third, obedience. Notice he says, My little children, these things write I unto you that ye sin not. And if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. And he is the propitiation for our sins, not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. And hereby we do know that we know him if we keep his commandments. He that saith, I know him, and keepeth not his commandments, is a liar, and his truth is not in him. But whoso keepeth his word in him, verily is the love of God perfected. Hereby know we that we are in him, and he that... He that saith he abideth in him ought himself also so to walk, even as he walked. So here now, obedience uh, to what God says, basically, to walk in the ways of God. As he begins, little children, I'm writing these things. Notice uh, the way that John deals uh, a good study, uh, and I have a sermon dealing with this, is why John wrote the book of 1 John. Uh, and he has the statements, I'm writing unto you, uh, back in chapter 1 and verse 4, these things write we unto you. Now in chapter 2 and verse 1, these things write I unto you. Uh, chapter 5 and verse 13 is another one, that you might know that you have eternal life. I'm writing these things too. So just go through sometime and look at, uh, study First John from the standpoint of why John says I'm writing to you. Of one, that you sin not. The word sin there is aorist tense. That you do not commit even one isolated act of sin. And we mentioned that in dealing with the aorist tense a while ago. So I won't really deal with it again uh, now. But that you never commit even an isolated act of sin. But if we do sin, and there again, if we sin... Um, there, again, is Eris tense, if we commit even an isolated act of sin. He's not dealing with someone now who's living in sin. But, he says, I'm writing so that you never commit an isolated act of sin, but when you do commit an isolated act of sin, what? We have an advocate with the Father. The word have is continue to have. It's present tense. We continue to have an advocate with the Father. Who is that advocate? He's Jesus Christ the righteous. Uh, the word advocate, and I think we've studied this word before, so won't, I'll just mention it, is the Greek word parakalesis, parakaletos. And it's translated as a comforter, as an encourager, 
it deals to a certain extent with uh, what we would think of as a lawyer who pleads our case to the Father. That's Jesus Christ, the righteous. Our time's up there, and so we're going to have to end our class at this point in time. I said next week I will be traveling, so uh, I'll have to encode the lesson early, uh, and uh, hopefully everything will be good and right, and uh, that these things will be profitable. And